My castaway this week is a footballer. Even if you don't know much about football, you'll know about him. He's one of its great names, the lad from a poor northeast mining village who followed his grandfather, uncles and brother into the game and became one of the team that won England the World Cup in 1966. For 21 years, he played for Leeds United, appearing for them more than 600 times and winning 35 England caps. When he stopped playing, he took up managing and for practically 10 years looked after the Republic of Ireland, leading them into the World Cup twice and so becoming an Irish hero. A tough, blunt Geordie, he says of himself as a footballer, the one thing I couldn't do was play, but I was very good at stopping other people playing. He is Jack Charlton. So your skill was not so much as a dynamic force then, Jack, as, as a man who got in everybody else's way? Well, that's the way defenders are. I mean, I was... As a young boy, um, never considered to be a player at all. I just was big and I could kick the ball and I could play among the kids in, in the park. And you were a I mean, tough tackler, you were I a was fighter. A, I was tough and, you know, I liked to fight. And I watch referees referee today and think to myself, uh, maybe I wouldn't have played now. Oh. I've been able to play now. Really? Well, this is... When you watch the way they operate and some of the games and some of the things that are punished with yellow cards and red cards, you sometimes wonder... How it would have been in my day, you know, we would probably finish up six aside. So you played rough? Well, the game has to be rough. I mean, if you don't play the game rough, you, uh, you lose something from it. I mean, you don't become a great player like Bobby Charlton or Dennis Law when people allow you to play or give you time to play or make excuses that nobody can tackle you to help you to play. You become a, a good player and a great player through adversity, through having to fight and learn in these, in these situations and how to avoid. So it's all a bit tame for you these days, I think it? it's a bit... Uh, it's getting a bit tame. The game is becoming more of a passing game, more of a slow build-up game, more of a continental game than, I'm, than I like. Right. I like the pace, the competition and the, uh, the will to win that used to be in English football. But you make it sound as if you were just, you know, a big, tough, physical player, as we say, who got in people's way. But in fact, it went, ran deeper than that. It was in the genes, wasn't it? Didn't you have a grandfather called oh, yeah. the war I mean, horse? We were brought up in a family, my brother and I, and my other two brothers as well were brought up in a family where my mother was the sister of four professional footballers, Jack, George, Jimmy and Stan, who played for various football clubs up and down the country, and Jackie Milburn, who was my me, me mother's uh, full cousin. So I was brought up in a situation where the only thing you played in Ashington was football. I mean, there was nothing else. But it was your mother that drove it. Oh, mother drove it, yeah. I mean, she was uh, very much... Uh, in love with the game of football. In fact, I, I one regret was that she was born a girl and not a boy. <laughs> do you remember your first pair of football boots? Yes, I do. I, I bought them uh, during the war. I saw an advert in the paper and uh, my mother gave me ten shillings to go and have a look at these second-hand pair of boots. And when I got there, there were Mansfield Hotspurs. And I remember looking at them. They were leather with big, hard toes. And I thought, well, I've never seen a pair of football boots like them. They were beautiful. And they were about a size too big for me, but it didn't matter. I bought them. I argued with a woman. Uh, I, I, she wanted 10 shillings and I gave her eight. And I took two shillings back to my mother. And how old were you? I was about six or seven, I think, at that time. So you were a tough negotiator even then? Well, too. Yeah, I've always been a negotiator. I was brought up in, a, in, a, in an area where nobody was very rich. And if you wanted anything, you had to work for it. And I've always worked for things. Tell me about your first record. First record was a Frank Sinatra and September song. I think it's a poignant song because it, it, it's virtually every person's life. When you listen to it through, uh, we have a house in the Yorkshire Dales and it's got, an, we've got a very old three-piece bedroom suite upstairs. And, and, and on the dresser, it's got like four tiles. The, the beginning, when you were born uh, in your teens, sort of the middle part of your life, and then the part where the, the guy with the sickle comes out. And, and, and when you look at these, and, the, and it's very old, and, and you think to yourself, yeah, you know, that's the four sort of parts of your life. And I always found this Frank Sinatra song like that, September song. Oh, it's a long, long while From May to December But the days grow short When you reach September When the autumn weather 
turns the leaves to flame One hasn't got time for the waiting game. Frank Sinatra and September Song. So you were born and bred, Jack, in the mining village of Ashington. What are your memories of that childhood home? And describe the house to me. Well, the house was... We didn't have a bathroom. We had a kitchen. Uh, you went from the front door straight on into the main street. Hmm. Um... The tin bath in front of the fire. The house was always clean and spotless. I always remember my mother was a very good housekeeper and she would always have the house clean and tidy and uh, our curtains were, were our main thing in our life. And you and your brothers, because you were the eldest, weren't you? Yes. There were four of you eventually. You all shared a bedroom? You all shared a bed? Yeah, we all shared a bed. I mean, we had a bedroom upstairs, which was me and my father's, and then we had the big bedroom next door, which we had a double bed in, and Bobby, Gordon, Tommy and myself used to all sleep in it together in the winter. Not always in the summer, because you also was a single bed, but in the winter it was very cold. Who slept in the middle was what you always used to fight over, because that was the warmest spot. <laughs> but who... who got it? Oh, usually me. And you, as the oldest, did you have to look after the others? Oh, yeah, you were very in much charge. so. Bobby particularly. I mean, Bobby was, I think there's about 18, two, not two years and eight months between me and our kid. And uh, I had to take him traipse him around, look after him during the day, make sure that he was OK, and uh, I didn't like it. Why I mean, not? Well, I was a... I like the sea, I like the countryside, I like to go bird nesting, I like to go picking blackberries, I like to go mushrooming, I like to go pick taties, and Bobby didn't. Bobby was more of a... He liked to play football, he liked to be around my mother, he liked to be at home, and when I had to drag him off somewhere, you know, it wasn't... Uh, it was I could have done more things without him than I had to do than I could do with him. But as it turned out in the end, of course, he began to succeed where you failed, didn't he? He you, he passed the eleven plus oh, yeah. and you'd failed it in that sort well, of thing. Well, that's right, yeah. Uh, and uh, and of course, his footballing talent was spotted very early on, and he was courted by eventually all those glamorous clubs from around the country. Did, how much did it stick in your craw? I know people Not always want to know that. Not at all. I liked playing football, but it wasn't the be all and end all of my life. Never. But is that why I wonder? Because he was so much better at you, it seemed early on at football. Ball. Is that perhaps why you nearly followed your dad down the pit? Be because you had living in front of you every day of your life somebody who was actually rather better than you? Well, I know not really because I could have gone to Leeds as a player. I could have gone to Newcastle and signed on and played for Newcastle. But I wasn't that interested in football. I was enjoying the sort of life that I had. I had a nice paper round. I delivered milk in the morning. I delivered groceries after school. I was a good earner as a kid. But your mother was ambitious for you, wasn't she? I mean, she wanted you. She didn't want you down the pit. I mean, that, no mother no, wanted no. her son no, to follow No, she didn't want the... us down the pit. And but I wasn't. I wasn't that keen on on leaving home. But did she see football as the means of escape for both? Well, of football you? was always a means of escape from Ashington, or from any northeast town. I mean, you either worked in the pit or you played football. And you, and, and when you when, when lads that had, that had left Ashington had gone away to play football. If they didn't succeed and had to come back, it was like a disgrace that failed. I didn't want to go away and fail. I think that was probably the reason. I didn't think I would make it. I didn't think I was going to be good enough. But you've got to remember, I actually played football in the first team for Leeds United before our kid even went to Manchester United. I developed very quickly between the age of just coming up to 16 and 17. And I, I actually played in the first team before I went in the army at 17. So I did develop and I did... Somebody must have seen that I had something to offer. And do you remember how much your first pay packet was from Leeds United? £4.50. That was when I was a ground staff lad. And now you're a millionaire. Oh, who told you? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your next record. My next record is Crocodile Shoes by Jimmy Nail. I've never met Jimmy Nail. I've, I enjoyed watching him on the television on a couple of occasions when I managed to see the programmes he did from the North East. And... Uh, I loved his song, Crocodile Shoes.
Jimmy Nail and Crocodile Shoes. You played for Leeds, Jack, for years and years before you were chosen to play for England. How old were you when the call finally came? I was nearly... Everybody gets this mixed up a little bit. I was nearly 29. But can you remember where you were when the call came? Oh, yeah. Ramsey? I, was, I do, exactly. I mean, I'd been picked to play for England, but I hadn't been told by Don Revy, the manager. He thought we had, we played Manchester United in the semi-final of the Cup at Nottingham. And uh, I actually had no idea when we went into the semi-final that evening and we won and we got through the cup final. And, and bro came, Brother Bobby was playing, playing yeah, for, played Man for Manchester United. United yeah. Yeah. And we came into the dressing room and then Don came across to me and he said, got some good news for you. He said, I didn't want to tell you before the game, but you've been picked to play for England against Scotland. And I went, you what? I couldn't believe it. So I immediately got dressed and I went to the Manchester United dressing room to see our kid, and I walked in through the room, and all the players, all the Man United players, just sat there with their heads in their hands, you know, it was... Depressed. Oh, depressed to a degree, after losing in the semi-final. I'd gone through a few of them myself. And I walked across and sat down next to our kid, and I said, you'll never guess. And he went, what? I said, I've been picked to play for England against Scotland. And he looked at me, and he went, oh, that's great. I'm, I'm delighted for you. In sort of that tone. And I mean, I suddenly looked round and I couldn't believe what I had done. I've walked into the semi, to the to the, the the dressing room of a team I just lost in the semi-final, with a smile all over my face, and and then I suddenly f I realised what I'd done. But you're not noted for your tact, are you? I'm not you? noticed for tact. No, I was it, I was so overjoyed. I'd, it never entered my head. I never mm. thought about it. I just went in to tell our kid. And of course. A year later, you and Bobby were in that World Cup side, as I said in the introduction, against West Germany at Wembley, July the 30th, 1966. Um, I gather that you might have been responsible almost for losing it at one point, because you kind of let a goal in almost, didn't you, that first German goal? I remember seeing the ball come towards me, and I sort of half stuck a foot out, and I, sw I think to this day I could have stopped, I could have put a foot to the ball, but I thought Gordon Banks was there, and the ball wasn't hit that hard. It was the one you sort of saw coming and saw go past you, and it was sort of a, a slight mix-up between the two of us, and it just fitted under Gordon's hand and passed my left foot. And after it, I thought, I could have stopped that. Hmm. But, but then again, we, we got back into the game. And at the end, when you did win, after extra time, you, you went down on your knees and kind of prayed, didn't you? I'm sure I prayed. I don't know what I did. I ran all the way up to get a hold of Jeff Hurst because Jeff had just scored the fourth goal. And I ran all the way up the park after an hour and a half of football and the extra time. And I ran all the way, uh, and, when I, and then Jeff ran off in a different direction. <laughs> and I turned around and I suddenly felt totally exhausted. And I collapsed on my knees and I put my hands on my head. I think I probably did say a little prayer, like, thank you, Lord, for the result or whatever. But that day, as I say, July 1966, a day never to be forgotten. It never is forgotten. Even football fans today who weren't born then, you know, talk about it as if they know it well and went through it with you. And yet you've been quoted since as saying that that was a pleasure that was surpassed later by things you subsequently achieved with Ireland. People say to me, was that the most memorable day of your life? And I say, well, not really, because unlike our kid or unlike Bobby Moore, I hadn't been with him for years and years aiming for this. I'd just sort of come in, done it, and gone. The time I felt the, the most joy was, was winning the league championship with Leeds at Liverpool, when we won it with a record number of points and we drew with Liverpool one uh, nil nil. But was even that experience eclipsed by things that happened with Ireland? That was the main, the main thing as a player. Uh, joys and management are totally different to join to joys as a player. I mean, y you work for a result. You work. You do your job, you, you, you're successful, you get the cup finals, you, you win cups, you win leagues. That's your job. When you're a manager, you've got to look after so many other things. 
the, 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 the way the team is prepared, the, the knowledge that you prepare them with, the amount of information you give them about the opposition. And, uh, so that joy is That is joy greater, is not it? for you, it's for other people. The joy for me was my football, what I achieved. My joy for other people was what we achieved in Ireland. Tell me about your third record. Roger Miller, King of the Road. I actually met Roger Miller in Vancouver. I went in to see him in concert, and I went to the back of the stage and said, could I meet Roger Moore? And the guy said, yes, go through, knock on that door. I went through, knocked on the door. The guy came to the door, Roger Miller, and he said, yes. I said, I'm from England. I would, uh, I'm going home in the morning. I would like to meet you. And I went in, had a beer with him, stayed half an hour or so, had a great chat, and it was a Roger Miller, King of the Road. Um, you retired, Jack, as a player at the age of 38. You went straight into management. This was 1973. You ran Middlesbrough, and then you ran Sheffield Wednesday, and uh, eventually you got to Newcastle. You weren't there very long, no, but there was a guy there called Paul Gascoigne. Yes, I spent a year at Newcastle, and there was a young lad on the ground staff called Paul Gascoigne. But yes. could you spot then, did you spot, that he was Only a Only when he, we played in the Youth Cup final at Watford, and uh, he was then in a Newcastle youth team, which was... Had some very good players in it. We actually won the Youth Cup that year, that, and, and Gasser played. And he scored a goal, the likes of which I've never seen. He ran across to the right-hand side of the field, Gaza, for a throw-in. For some, A throw-in was being taken. Just into the Watford half. He, 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 he ducked, let the ball go over his head, turned and ran with the ball across the field towards the corner flag, running across the field, and the guy was chasing him all the way across, and then he suddenly stopped, checked. The guy slid past him, Paul turned round, and the ball was right underneath his feet. And he was about 25, 30 yards out from goals. Now, in order to chip a goalkeeper from that distance, you would have pushed the ball away a yard and then tried to chip mm. him. But in that time, you did that. The goalkeeper would have gone back and picked up a better position. Paul looked up, saw the goalkeeper off his line, and he dug the outside of his right foot, like, scooped it with the outside of his right foot, and the ball sort of bent, went up in the air, over the top of the goalkeeper, who was going backwards, and the ball bounced on, into, the, into the back of the net. That was when Gaza was just starting to come through as a player. We'd put him on a high-protein diet, we used to pay for him to go on a mistake. You weren't noted for spending a lot of money, were you? No, I didn't. I, I always felt that when you go into a football club, you should have a good look at what you got. And uh, then when you find out what you need, then replace it but you build a team. There used to be a joke that managers used to say, now go into the players and say, now look, we've only got four matches to play, have a real effort this time, and then we'll get into the Premier Division, we'll get loads of money and we can go and buy better players to keep us there. It used to be a joke, now it's a reality. Mm. It's a reality. And you never know how people will perform at a higher level until you've given them the opportunity to show you. But it's also all to do with the kind of chap you are, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I've you always were... been very, very... I was brought up where money was important and you had to earn a living, and I've always had to earn a living. And everything might come in useful one day, so you better hold on hold to it on and to it use and, it to its full extent. That's right, it's... maybe I got that from my father, you know. He used to burn wood just to get the, 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 the screws out and the nails and he'd straighten them out. Never bought a screw in his life, my father. Record number four. The Dubliners in dirty old town. 
I met the Dubliners years ago when I used to coach in Vancouver many, many years ago, and I got introduced to them. They were on, on tour out there. And they've become, all become friends of mine since, and typically Irish, and what the Irish are about. You know, good music, good fun, and enjoy yourself. I met my love by the gasworks crawl. I dreamed a dream by the old canal. I kissed my girl by the factory wall. Dirty old town, dirty old town. I heard a siren. From the door, saw a train set the night on fire. I smelled the spring on the smoky way. Dirty old town, dirty old the Dubliners and Dirty Old Town from a live recording they made in Amsterdam. So, Jack, you were appointed manager of the Republic of Ireland in 1986 and immediately and, and stubbornly, they say, you imposed your style of what they call kick-and-rush football on them. No, yeah. people that have said that of us are totally wrong. We had to design a game that would frustrate international teams at a level we wanted to compete at. And I had to come up with an, a way of playing that would cause them problems. Nobody had ever put the defenders in, in, into a position to see if they could play. You know, we always assumed they could play because you get so many numbers back and they can head the ball out, they kick the ball away and they, they play. But nobody ever really applied what you call pressure. Now, I wanted to apply pressure. I'd seen the World Cup in uh, Mexico, in, it was at 86. And uh, it was like peas in a pod. Everybody played the same way, threw a playmaker in midfield, and unless the playmaker was in a good position to go with the back four, nobody would commit themselves forward. The, the, the team with the best centre midfield player won the World Cup, which was Maradona playing for Argentina. And I thought, we can't enter this fray the way they play. Because you hadn't got enough good players. We, well, we, got, we, got, we, got, we could get the players to play in a similar type of game, but they have had 15, 10 to 15, 20 years start on playing that game. Now, for us to enter that fray and play that type of game would have been nonsense. Why? Just let, I, let's just have it straight. It, this is because they would be playing with the ball, passing the ball in their own half, which is very dangerous because somebody dangerous. could come along and shove yes. it in the goal. Right. Uh, so yes. you want to kick and, kick and rush means no. get it up the field no, as fast no, as you can no, out no, of danger. No, definitely not, Sue. Definitely no. not. That was never the way. Everything was designed. Each player had what they were what were they supposed to do. If we got to the foot the, the ball to a fullback, what you need to do is you need to, to hit to, to pass the long ball to an area where your player knows the ball is going to be delivered. Mm. So he is already on his way there before the defender knows where the ball is going. And it began to work. And it worked like a charm. We, we beat Brazil. But it depended on people playing exactly as you said. You almost, as a manager, want to programme players, don't you, to have an instinctive reaction no, to no. do what you believe they should players. do. players. In, in a way, it's unprogrammed players. See, I give each player one individual thing to do. John Aldridge knew that when Dennis Irwin got the ball at right back, that the ball would be knocked in behind the fullback. So John was programmed into going for that. Mm. Ray Houghton knew that the moment John got to the ball first, he had to be somebody in front of him. So, so there was a knew... set thing for them to do. It does make them into automatons to an well, extent, it, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, but you see, only to a degree into the last third of the play of, of the park. Some of your critics in Ireland oh. said that this was a crude way of no, playing, no, that no, you no. were taking all that wonderful what artistic is, stuff out of the game where is, people what move is for the ball. What is football about? It's about winning, isn't it? It's about winning. It's about scoring goals. How you score them and how you go about it is a matter of opinion. Now, they might have had a different opinion to me, but I saw what was necessary for us to get results and to move the team. It amazes me that teams like Milan and many of the European teams, now there's a terminology in European football called um, pressing. We were doing that in 1986. But now it's considered a good thing in the game of football to press. The Irish were pressing people in 86. We invented the game. And as we say, it worked. And, and you, it worked. You, you even got to meet the Pope. 
as a result is, and the Pope, what is more, recognised Jack Charlton. What did he say to you? <laughs> I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to go to him, because all, all the lads are Catholics and all the officials are Catholics, and I was the only Protestant in the place. And he was talking to little Charlie, Charlie O'Leary, one of our boot, boot, the lad that looks after the kit. And, uh, and then he turned to me, and, he, and his aide said, uh, you have Mr. This is Mr. Charlton. And he just looked at me and he said, yes, I know. He said, uh, the boss. Next piece of music. Chris de Berg. I, I never get it right. I always call him Chris de Berg. And the wife keeps telling me I'm not saying it properly. But Chris is a good friend of mine. And I've known him quite a few years. He follows the Irish team and he has done for many years. He sang Lady in Red after we lost to the Italians in Rome at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, as the dawn was coming up, and he sang it for us. And uh, I would have played that one, because that's my favourite, but it's been played all the time on radio, so I thought, well, let's let's go for his Don't Pay the Ferryman, because that's also one of his best songs. It was late at night on the open road, Speeding like a man on the run A lifetime spent preparing for the journey He is closer now Christopher Berg and Don't Pay the Ferryman from his album The Getaway. So, Jack Charlton, you were, as you said, very much an outsider as far as Ireland was concerned. You didn't know much about it before you went there, but they, they made you one of them because of all of this success. They made you a freeman of the city of Dublin, an honorary Irishman, the Taoiseach said. Irish citizen. Can you, can you describe what that meant to uh, you uh, as an individual? We're surprised, you see, because... In England, we don't do that. You, 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 you've got to win something. If we'd have won the World Cup, I would have expected it. But when you don't win it, when you get sort of get to the last eight of the World Cup, which for a country the size of Ireland was amazing. I mean, it's the smallest country ever to get that far. I had no real idea how it would build up, but it didn't happen immediately. It, it happened over a period of years when we went to Germany and then when we went to America and then we went to, when we went to Italy. And, and, and the expectancy of the Irish never changed. They weren't interested that, you know, we're not going to win the World Cup. They never even dreamt that that was a possibility. The, the mate, some of them might have said, we've got a good chance, and we always had a chance. But there was no real pressure applied on me. The thing was to qualify. But you still sound quite distanced, as it were, from the adulation. You sound like somebody who observed this adulation and, and wondered at it. Did it, did it touch you somehow? I, I don't like the word adulation. It's, it's not one that... that uh, the friends are mine. I like to think of the Irish as friends are mine. I mean, I've, I've met thousands and thousands of them. If I stop in a pub or I stop in a restaurant on the way across Ireland, invariably somebody sends me a pint of Guinness over or somebody pays for me meal or somebody that, 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 that won't take the money. And they... You're still observing they, how they are, though, but what does it do to you? What did they, it make they, you feel? I don't know. I don't know. Grateful. Grateful. I think that's the only word I can use. There's another bit of, of, of analysis of Jack Charlton that comes into play here, which is that all of that success in Ireland was perhaps even more important to you than it might have been because it was the first time you'd stepped out from behind the shadow of your younger brother, that you did something, you achieved something that he never did. Not really. I mean, I achieved pretty well. I won competitions that he didn't win. He won competitions that I didn't win. But we had, as far as winning things and and putting things on the table, I did as well with Leeds United as he did with Manchester United. But he never managed a team. He never, well, and no, he never but you see, we, we, we prepare ourselves in a different way. I was always a coach. I went through my lily show days and I went through all my sessions and I'd spent years and years and years uh, until they made me a staff coach at the age of about 27. I always wanted to go into management. I'm not sure that our kid was prepared properly for what it was like to make the decisions. When you get involved in coaching, you've got to make the decisions. And maybe in my character, that's a little bit different. I don't know. But jealousy, no. 
I was sorry that he didn't make it in management. I wish he had. I wish he had made it in management. You know, we would probably be better friends if he had it done. I mean, him moving away and going to be, and to be a director and to be looking for the higher echelons of the game of football is maybe what has pushed us apart a little bit over the years. Maybe if we'd had something in common, like problems of being a manager over a period of 20 odd years, maybe we would have been better friends, who knows? More music. Red Rose Cafe. We've all been in this sort of situation. And it's a song that we used to sing on the bus when we went to games with the team, and with the Irish. And, uh, and but, it's, but it's happened to me all through my football in life. You always finished up in Lisbon and Amsterdam and in some Red Rose Cafe where you went for a drink and there was always the characters about and the girls sat at the bar. They come from the farms and the factories too And they all soon forget who they are The cares of today are soon washed away As they sit at a stool by the bar The girl with green eyes in the Rolling Stone shirt Doesn't look like she walks on the line The man at the end He's a very good friend Of a man who sells cars second hand Down at the Red Rose Cafe In the harbour There by the port just outside Amsterdam Everyone shares in the songs and the laughter. Everyone there is so happy to be there. Red Rose Cafe by The Furies. So, Jack, you, you bought your mum and dad um, a house uh, with your 1966 World Cup bonus, didn't you? Uh, and you looked after her, really, for, for the rest of her life, didn't you? Well, I kept in touch with them all the time. And, I mean, I've always lived in the North East, and so I, I saw quite a lot of them. And uh, But you looked after her, Yeah, I looked after her. I bought them a house in 1966. For the first time in their lives, they had a, a toilet and a, a kitchen and a bathroom. And it was it was wonderful. And nice feeling I, that though for you to be able to give give them that. Yeah, it was actually. I mean, it wasn't particularly that it was the money was quite a lot. It was, but it, it was uh, it was something that I'd always thought that I would do for them when I could afford it, and get them out of uh, of where they lived. Mm. And then your father died, of course, back in eighty two. But your mother died earlier this year, and I think that. Um, most people remember you for Charlton boys carrying her coffin. And people will also remember talk of a rift in the family that Bobby hadn't seen her before. I she... don't really want to get involved with that, Sue. It, it, Bobby did what Bobby wants to do. I mean, it was strange to me. I couldn't understand why there was a rift between Bobby and my mother. I couldn't understand it. And I, I, I really don't understand it to this day from being very much a homeboy and a lad that was his mother's, apple of his mother's eye, suddenly he just stopped going home. I don't know why. And has that damaged your relationship with him as well? Oh, I think so. I think so. How deeply damaged? Only time will tell. I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't ignore him. I walk in and... I have ignored him on the odd occasion, but uh, I've, I regret that. That's silly. That's silly. Life's too short to argue about things like that. And he's still our kid. He's still our kid, and he's still my brother, and uh, I'm sure one of these days we'll... we'll either have a good fight or we'll have a good argument over it. Record number seven. Christy Moore and Delirium Tremens. And... It's not a song I know very well of Christie's, or I didn't think when I heard the, the title. And then when I heard the song, I've been singing it for donkey years, and uh, it's a good song, and it's, it's one of Christie's best. I dreamt a dream the other night. I couldn't sleep a wink. The rats were trying to count the sheep, and I was off to drink. There was footsteps in the parlour, Voices on the stairs I was climbing up the wall And moving round the chairs 
I looked out from under the blanket and up at the fireplace and the Pope and John F. Kennedy were staring in my face. Suddenly it dawned on me I was getting the old ETs when the child of Prague began to dance around the mantelpiece. Goodbye to the port and brandy, to the vodka and the stag, to the smidic and the harpic, to bottle the raft and keg. As I sat looking up at the Guinness ad, I could never figure out how your man stayed up on the surfboard after 14 pints of stout. Christy Moore and Delirium Tremens from his album Ordinary Man. So, Jack, you could, I mean, obviously, from everything you said, I mean, you're 61 years old, you could put your feet up tomorrow if you wanted to, but if the phone rings and it's a club that wants managing, I get the feeling that you'd be there. Whether I want to go back into the game of football is... I'll find out before the end of this football season whether I miss it or not, whether I miss the involvement... Whether it's time that I called it a day, I will know me, I will know better after I've been out of the job for a year or so. But if the call came and it was to manage England, let's just put Glenn Hoddle, for the purposes of this question, to one side a minute, you'd be out there like a shot, oh, wouldn't you? Oh, I've always wanted to manage England. I would love to have managed England at some stage, but I've never been in a situation where the job was right at the time. I once wrote a letter and applied and never got a reply. And I, I, I can never understand that. It made me feel a little bit bitter about the way I was thought of in English football. This idea that people think that all I, I know about a kick and rush game of football, nonsense. I know the game from A to, a to Z. In every way you want to play, I can play it. But I play what's necessary to suit the team that I'm working with and playing with. So you're flexible and you're available. I'll argue football with anybody in the world. Last record. Last record, Lee Marvin and Wandering Star. I did a bit of this in my time. I've wandered all over the place. And if anybody's followed a wandering star, it's been me. seen a sight that didn't look better looking back I was born under a wandering star Mud can make you prisoner and the plains can bake you dry Snow can burn your eyes but only people make you cry Home is made for coming from for dreams of going to which with any luck will never come true. Lee Marvin and Wandering Star. And what's more, I can tell you, Jack Charlton can sing better than him. You no, could. I can't. It sounded quite good to me. <laughs> if you could only take one of those eight records, Jack, which one would it be? If I could take one of the eight records, I think it would be September Song by Frank Sinatra. I've listened to him all my life up to now. And why change? What about a book? You've got the Bible and Shakespeare there. The book I wanted, really, was, was the one on survival. I would like an encyclopedia of how to survive in the wild and uh, just to help me along with what I already know. It's probably against the rules because it's a bit practical, but I think if that's what you want. And what about a luxury? A luxury? A fishing rod. I have to have a fishing rod. I mean, I expect to get some hooks with it. I mean, I can sit all day on the rocks, catching nothing, and just looking around and, 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 and relaxing and enjoying it and with the expectancy that I might get something. Of course, on a desert island, I would have to catch something, so a fishing rod would also be a necessity. And it would make you happy? Oh, it would make me very happy. Jack Charlton, thank you very much indeed for letting us hear your desert island discs. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> 